we have the real pleasure to be with online from New Jersey, Pete Mandek, a professor of philosophy at William Patterson University, uh, who uh, we heard you on a podcast recently and we're so fascinated by it. I think we, we signed you up or I contacted you immediately. And uh, uh, there were so many fascinating things to think about that we wanted to talk to you about today and really appreciate your being with us. So, My pleasure. So is it is it fair to assume everyone here heard the podcast or no? Should yeah. I not assume that? Assume okay. that nobody did. <laughs> oh, okay, no problem. So um, I'm I'm comfortable proceeding in many different ways, uh, whatever best works for the group. So if people wanted to move to questions, um, maybe, you know that's fine with me. Maybe it would be great uh, for, uh, to begin with, just to uh, tell us what your research is. Yeah, kind of a short overview of your main interests. And... Sure. So, um, so just a little bit about my background. I have a, a PhD, kind of an unusual PhD that combines philosophy with neuroscience and psychology. And I earned that in the year 2000 at Washington University in St. Louis. And my research projects and teaching interests have been about that combination of disciplines, philosophy and neuroscience and psychology. And right now I, at William Patterson University, I teach mostly philosophy classes, but I also teach psychology classes and cognitive science classes. Um, the, uh, the stuff that I work on, almost all of it has something or other to do with consciousness. Um, and so, time permitting, I'd be happy to get into questions about like, can, you know, how far does consciousness extend into our biosphere? Like what non-human creatures have consciousness? Is it, you know, probably dogs and cats, but what about single celled organisms? So that, that's something I've worked on. I would be happy to talk about but also non-living systems. So could there be artificial intelligence systems or robots and, uh, that would be conscious? Um, that's another area that I'm interested in and, and have done a lot of work on. And then there's just general stuff about what should we think about the relationship uh, of consciousness to physical reality? Like for example, the brain. Um, a lot of the philosophy issues in this neck of the woods all kind of come down to the mind body problem, which is this issue about whether mind is something we might say spiritual um, or even supernatural, or is it instead something that just kind of fits in with the rest of the natural world? In a, one very simple version would be that the mind just is the brain. And so just to be very quick, uh, here's the spoiler version i think that you know for all sakes and purposes the mind is the brain um the only uh little extra bits i would add to that would would be to allow that artificial intelligence robots who in some sense don't have brains they could still have consciousness too and then with respect to the question of well how far does it extend into our biosphere um, I'm prepared to say it goes pretty far, um, and I'd be happy to talk about arguments for thinking that consciousness is actually something you could find in an E. coli bacterium. And there's a very, I think, rigorous way of, of, of making that case. Um, so some of the, some of the stuff that I've been working on in that area has been very specifically focused on color vision. I think in a lot of ways, color vision is like the, the most vivid illustration of what we're interested in when we're interested in consciousness. Uh, one, of the, one of the main examples people always come back to is seeing the color red. Uh, and there's, there's interesting reasons for that. Like why is it that we're so attracted to color why is it so important to us as the creatures we are, but also just the science of color and why that's actually been very difficult. And, and so why is it the color is the 
problem case instead of talking about like say smelling or tasting why do we we focus in on color and then there's other issues in that neck of the woods uh concerning how to understand the relationship between for example color experiences and other stuff happening in the mind so for example it's one thing to see that they're uh you know to see i have an orange uh, oranges printed on my shirt and it's another thing to think about it or to uh you, you know so you might think of this as like the difference between a picture and a sentence kind of gives you a feel of the difference between uh an actual perceptual experience on the one hand versus a thought on the other hand so um i've argued that uh those visual experiences are actually a lot more like thoughts than we might have realized that we might pre-theoretically have suspected that they're very different. These are very different mental states, but I've argued that they're, they're actually quite similar uh, and, and, and that that helps us understand what's weird or puzzling about consciousness is that we have this tendency to think that it's separate from thought. That's a very different animal it's a very different kind of mental state from like thinking the way you might be thinking right now that um sometimes there's more than 28 days in february or you're thinking right now about how pi is an irrational number that's one kind of mental process but seeing that this is this is orange that's a very different kind of mental process yeah. so you anyway know. that's all kind of just rambling to give you a, a kind of a sampling of what might be on the menu uh, if one of the, you know, people are more interested in robots, I'm happy to go more with robots. If people are more interested in brains, I've got things to say about uh, brains. Um, if things, people want to hear about conscious E. coli, uh, I'm happy to, to go there. Um, something I'm working on right now is a book that's under contract with Cambridge University Press called Physicalistic Theories of Consciousness. Um, uh, something I just finished is a second edition of my book on the philosophy of mind called this is philosophy of mind. Um, so those are, that's a bit of like the, the menu. Um, uh, it's hard to know where to begin uh, where I'm at or, um, what uh, one of our members already has a question for you though. Uh, oh, we, I didn't, I haven't been looking at the chat. We can monitor that. Yeah. We'll, we'll, you. we'll moderate the chat. For you. Oh, okay. I'm going to, let you do that then. All right, great. Okay. Could we start with just a couple of, I hate to say definitions, but what do you mean when you say mind and what do you mean when you say consciousness? I'd be happy to, to tackle that. Although here's a, a funny little, uh, or at least funny to me, uh, anecdote. So the first book I ever wrote was a book of definitions. Uh -huh. <laughs> of terms that are important for the philosophy of mind. And after the book was published, I realized that the one term that never gets defined in the whole book is the term mind. Right. So, so there's all these definitions of consciousness, several, several different definitions of consciousness and definitions of belief and memory and perception. But even though the word mind is part of the title of the book, uh, it never did bother defining that but anyways uh so you asked for mind what was the other one consciousness yeah so let me start with mind um there's a tradition in um especially in the west of thinking about the in this probably we could trace this back to aristotle uh, if not earlier of thinking of the mind in terms of um mental states so whatever the mind is it's like a collection of mental states individual mental states would include things like beliefs, desires, hoping, wondering, um, experiences, feelings, so feeling cold versus feeling tired, smelling uh, the scent of, of lemon, uh, tasting uh, some uh, hot spicy chili. So there's all these different mental states. And then you could ask this question that's very much like your mind question. Well, what is, what are those? Like what it, is there something that they all have in common um, that unites them, that makes them mental states? And the answer that you get in the Western tradition is that something like, in order for something to be a mental state, it has to have one uh, 
of the following two properties. If it, as long as it has at least one of them, then it's a mental state. It might have both of them. Um, so one of the mental properties is something called intentionality, which is a technical term from medieval European philosophy that, that if we were to try to translate into English, ordinary English would be something like aboutness. So um, right now I'm thinking about Abraham Lincoln. I'm thinking about how Abraham Lincoln often is depicted as having a beard, but not a mustache. So that mental state has aboutness. It's about Abraham Lincoln. And um, aboutness is kind of analogous to like um, in language, uh, uh, when a sentence has a grammatical subject, the grammatical subject of a sentence uh, is what the sentence is about. So there's a corresponding thought I would have and my thought is about, you know, whatever the grammatical subject of the sentence is I would use to express that thought. So that's intentionality. Intentionality is aboutness. Then there's this other mental property or this other property that is thought to be definitive of the mental. And that sometimes gets called uh, qualitative properties or sometimes gets called phenomenality. Um, examples of that would be like, for example, seeing red. So I see a ripe tomato or some fresh spilled blood. Um, and now, maybe that's just more intentionality or maybe that's something else besides. Um, the, the people that suspect that it's something else, that it's not intentionality, but it's nonetheless mental, they reserve the word phenomenality or qualitativeness. Um, so one way to kind of spell that out while assuming the phenomenality is different from intentionality, you might say, look at the difference between thinking that there's a, a red rose in the kitchen and seeing that there's a red rose in the kitchen. Um, when you see that there's a red rose in the kitchen, your, your experience has a certain property. It, it, presumably the rose has a property too, but the experience has a property. And the experience of seeing a red rose, the experience has a property that your thought doesn't have. When you think that there's a red rose in the kitchen, the thinking is about the red rose. Uh, it's, about the, it's about the rose. It's about the rose being red. But it doesn't have this, that inner property that makes the, the visual experience of the red rose visual. Um, so qualitative properties or phenomenal properties are the, those properties that would, for example, differentiate seeing uh, something as red versus seeing it as green, but also differentiate seeing from smelling and also would differentiate in general sensing from thinking. So to wrap this up as a definition of the mind, the mind is like a, co a collection of mental states. What makes the states mental is that they each of them has one or both of the following two properties, intentionality or phenomenality. So moving on to consciousness, what is, how do you define consciousness? That's a very vexing area. A lot of fights over how to define consciousness. Um, so there's no non-controversial way to do it. There's probably um, three, like if you were to look at the contemporary literature, of people trying to give definitions of consciousness. Um, one way to simplify to say there's three main definitions that people work with. Um, and, and it's worth mentioning that all three of these definitions focus on states and, and what it means for a state to be conscious. Um, even though sometimes we use the word conscious or the word consciousness to describe creatures. So we might say, Mandic is conscious. Like, I mean, he's not unconscious. I'm, I'm not under general anesthetic. I haven't recently been punched in the head. So, I'm, so you might say of a whole creature that they're conscious. But what I'm gonna define in defining consciousness is the use of that word to apply to mental states, what it means for a mental state to be conscious. One thing that it might mean for a mental state to be conscious is just what I was talking about a little bit ago, that it has phenomenality. So um, on that definition, what it means for a mental state to be conscious, thoughts, properly speaking, aren't conscious because they don't have phenomenality. 
they only have intentionality. If you want an example on this definition of a conscious state, where a conscious state is just a state with phenomenality, an example would be seeing red. A visual experience of red would be an example of a conscious state. So that's one definition of a conscious state. And one way that it sometimes gets put in the philosophical literature is um, in connection with the phrase, what it's like. This is something that comes up um, a really big deal gets made of this in the 1970s with the publication of an article by Thomas Nagel called, What is it like to be a bat? We can appreciate the sense of that question. We, we kind of get the idea that bats are different from us. Some bats get by more with a kind of sonar than vision. And we can kind of wrap our head around that a little bit. Um, those of us who are sighted nonetheless have experiences whereby we can tell the size of a room just by the ambient noises in the room. You get a sense that w of whether you're in a big room or someone has guided you into a, a closet just by the way it sounds. And you could even do things like make little clicking noises or beep beep noises then move your face close to a wall. And as you get closer to the wall, you can hear the difference. You might not know how to describe what that difference is, but you get it. Um, and so we might imagine what it's like to be a bat. Or we might ask questions about like whether you can know what it's like to see red, even if you've never seen it before. There's this thought experiment of Mary, the futuristic neuroscientist who grew up in a black and white room and only read about what happens in brains when people see red. But she read it in books that were printed in black and white and shades of gray. Could she know what it's like to see red? So that what it's like phraseology is, is supposed to be picking out uh, a specific kind of definition of consciousness, which is consciousness as phenomenality. But the, there's, a, there's a second and third definition of consciousness that maybe lines up with that or maybe just goes in different directions. A second way of attempting to define consciousness is to say that consciousness is something like self-awareness. What it means for a state to be conscious is for you to be aware of that state. One way of, of illustrating this definition of, of consciousness might be to think of cases in which someone has a mental state, but it seems clear it's not a conscious mental state, or closely related cases in which someone has a mental state that isn't conscious, and then it becomes conscious. So one kind of illustration of that would be, um, suppose you're talking to a friend and you ask the friend, why are you so angry? And the friend initially denies that they're angry. What do you mean? What, what do you mean I'm angry? What do you mean I'm angry? And <laughs> I'm not angry. And then they hear their own voice. Uh, and a heartbeat later, they realize, oh, I guess I am pretty angry. They might even realize that they've been angry for a while. One way of describing what's going on there is for a, a relatively long duration, they've had this state, this emotional state of anger, but it wasn't conscious anger. And it wasn't conscious anger because they weren't aware of the anger. But later on, when you bring it to their attention and they, you know, hear the sound of their own voice or just attend to the feeling of their body, they realize like they're really angry. Uh, they've been angry all along, perhaps. Um, so one way of describing what, what it is for a state to be conscious along this other definition is to say a, a, a conscious state is one that you're aware of. Maybe that awareness involves a thought. You, you, you have this thought about this other mental state and that's what makes it a conscious mental state. But if you didn't have the thought that you're in that mental state, then that mental state would be occurring non-consciously. And then just real quick, the third definition of what a, a, a conscious state is would be any state that has intentionality. So if you are in a mental state that's about the world, in some sense, you're conscious of the world. You might not be, you might not be conscious in that second sense, you might not be conscious of your consciousness of the world, but if you're responding to stimuli, for example, um, you know, think of the absent-minded long-distance driver, someone driving a truck and, you know, listening to the radio or thinking about an argument that they got in recently, they might not really be paying attention to what they're doing. And we've maybe have all had that experience. Like you realize like, wow, I've been driving for 20 20 minutes and I wasn't really 
but I didn't realize I had my blinker on the whole time. <laughs> like, wow. Um, so in some sense, you're aware of what's going, like you didn't crash the vehicle. The, the road has been bending and turning and there's been other vehicles and you've successfully kept you and your passengers alive. And it wasn't a miracle that you did that. Information is coming into your eyes and you can feel the, the moving of the vehicle. And on some level, um, you're, you're conscious of the external world, but you don't have this inner reflective consciousness. Um, so there's three ways of, of defining consciousness. And there's all sorts of interesting fights that philosophers and cognitive scientists get into about which of those definitions uh, is the right way to go. Um, which of those definitions might just collapse into one of the other definitions. Um, it's perhaps worth mentioning that a lot of a lot of research on consciousness implicitly assumes that second uh, definition, the one whereby a conscious state is one that you're aware of. And if you think about how you would try to do a science of consciousness, you realize you're kind of stuck with something like that definition. Um, one of the main ways in like which we try to figure out whether someone had a conscious state uh, is we, we ask them. So here's an interesting experimental paradigm that gets at this sort of stuff. It's, um, it's an experimental paradigm known as uh, masks priming. Mm -hmm. So you present uh, someone with visual stimuli on a computer screen, but you control how long that stimulus is present on the, on the computer screen. And you know you can make this really brief and have very precise measurements of exactly how long it's on the computer screen. Um, and then you could do this, uh, present another stimulus called a mask. So for example, if the stimuli were pictures of animals, the mask stimulus would just be like snow, you know, from a staticky television. Um, so you show someone just really briefly, a fraction of a second picture of a, a giraffe. And then immediately after that, you show them this visual mask. And for most people, um, presenting that visual mask results in the person saying they didn't see anything. So you real quick show them a draft and then you present the mask and you ask them, what did you see? And they'll say nothing. Or if you ask them, what animal did you say? They will say, I don't know. I mean, I didn't see any animals. Like I told you, I didn't see anything. And then you show them a picture of an elephant. Well, what was that? I don't know. I guess maybe I saw some static. Um, but you can show that the information is getting in there. So for example, if you force them to guess, or if you just force them to say the first animal that comes to mind, or if you give them a task, like for example, complete this word, you show them some letters and you're like, okay, there's three blanks here. You need three letters to complete this word. What do you put in there to make an English word? And you could select words so that it's ambiguous. You know, it could, you can complete it in several different ways, but only one of them will be the name of an animal. Well, it turns out that um, people are better than chance at getting the right animal or completing the, the word uh, in such a way that it names the animal, even though they claim they didn't, they didn't see an animal. So it's very tempting to say that what is going on there is they, they unconsciously saw the giraffe. So they have a mental state. It, it, the mental state is indicating the presence of a giraffe. This is what explains why they're better than chance at guessing that it was a giraffe. Um, but it's very, it seems very natural to say this is kind of like that anger case I was describing where they had an unconscious anger. Later on, they become conscious of the anger or aware of the anger, perhaps in virtue of having a higher order thought, a thought not about the world, but about that mental state, the perception of uh, or feeling of anger or in our prime masking case, the, the perception of a giraffe. So you can have an unconscious perception of a giraffe. Um, so a lot of the, the point here is just that a lot of consciousness research, like in experimental settings, kind of winds up treating the definition of consciousness as that second definition, where the definition is um, a, con a conscious state is a state of which you are aware 
you're aware of yourself as being in that state. So, but if, the, oh yeah, go ahead. For the purposes of tonight, when you say consciousness, is that what you are meaning? No, I, um, I wish it was that easy. So yeah. when I say conscious, I, I'm, I'm inclined to think that uh, probably we need all three of those definitions. Okay. And, and because a lot of what, especially philosophers are interested in is that what it's like definition. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that, that philosophers are really, like the philosophers that are upset about consciousness, that's what they're upset about. Um, because that seems to be the greatest mystery that's the sense of consciousness that you know many of you I'm sure are familiar with the phrase the hard problem of consciousness when philosophers talk about the hard problem of consciousness or or forecast that will never solve the hard problem of consciousness that will never explain how consciousness is able to arise from the brain what they mean is consciousness in that phenomenal sense of consciousness in that sense uh, whereby a conscious state is a state such that there's something it's like to be in it so you might you know, to really get a, to get a feel for that definition of consciousness, you just think of, for example, a visual experience of orange and just, you know, wonder like, well, why, why, why is it like that? Couldn't it have been like nothing at all? Couldn't, you know, you know, a lot of people I think will, are happy to suppose that a calculator or a computer has no consciousness there's nothing it's like to be a computer even though a computer is able to represent information and and in some sense manipulate that information in a way that's very adaptive might even want to call that intelligent um why aren't we like that why are, why don't we just react to stimuli without there being something it's like um and i do think that that's an interesting problem um now, I think you could later on give arguments for colla maybe collapsing that to one of the other, other two definitions, but for the purposes of starting off or introducing the topic, um, I'm not going to just focus on one of the definitions. I'm going to have all three of them in mind and try to be as clear as possible which one I have in mind uh, when I'm talking about it. Okay. I, I should add in the self. I mean. Could you, would you mind just saying what the self is related to consciousness? Yeah, so um, a, lot of, a lot of discussions in philosophy about the self come down to this debate that in European philosophy, you can characterize the debate between Rene Descartes and uh, David Hume. But if we look at philosophy more broadly, to include world traditions besides the European tradition, we see versions of this sort of issue in, for example, Buddhist philosophy. So a lot of people know that a big difference between pre-Buddhist Indian philosophy and then Buddhist philosophy is this view about whether there is such a thing as the self. Um, so if we look at the European debate, you, you see on the one side, David Hume, who's an empiricist, meaning he thinks all knowledge comes in through the senses, all ideas that are coherent, meaningful ideas or ideas that you should be able to define in terms of sensory experience. And so he goes looking for the self. And the self is supposed to be the thing that has experiences. And he, and he says, whenever I look inward and go looking for the self, go looking for the thing that has the experiences, I find nothing at all. The only thing I find are the experiences. Or um, the way he would put it is the, the sensory ideas. I don't find a thing that has the ideas, I just find the ideas. So his conclusion then is that, well, there's, there's just nothing for the self to be. Another way of interpreting Hume there is a little less extreme sounding. And that is to say something like, what the self is, is this changing bundle of ideas. So there isn't any one set of ideas or one set of experiences that is the self, um, that the self is, is kind of like a baseball team and you know players can be traded in and out and retire and die and it's still the yankees in some sense it's still the same team even none of the, even though none of the original players are still there on the yankees they're the yankees and maybe the self is like that um but 
there's this more extreme interpretation whereby there just is no self. There's no self. In Buddhism, most interpretations of Buddhism interpret the Buddha as having a doctrine of no self. There's no thing, meaning there's no constant unchanging thing, which is you. There's just this changing flux. Um, th now, the other side of that uh, in the West is Descartes. Descartes says, well, I mean, there's got to be in all sorts of cases in which there are properties, there are the things that have the properties. Um, and so when it comes to, when it comes to mental properties, like phenomenality or intentionality, there has to be the things that have the mental properties. So for Descartes, the, you know, he, he's got, I think, I think that's the thing that he is most certain of. And then from there, I think, well, what am I? <laughs> a thinking thing a thing that thinks so if there's thinking there's got to be a thinker um so anyway those are the main positions and i i tend to come down on more the hume or or buddha side of things that um if there is a self at all it certainly isn't some unchanging spiritual substance the way that descartes um would have it um I'm, in, I'm inclined to think that, you know, if there's anything at all that's worth calling the thinker or the self, it's, it's like this, this organism, it, you know, so in this organism is maybe more like a baseball team in the sense that, you know, literally my parts are leaving and being replaced perhaps every seven years, the material of my body has been completely replaced. Um, but nonetheless, like I'm still Peter John Mandic the third. I've been, even though all the material in my body has been replaced uh, in the past seven years, I've been married for longer than that, you know, and I'm still, I still have, have these obligations, these vows. Your, your uh, wife still recognizes you. Yeah, yeah. Or so she says. Um, so, you know, if you ask me what, I, what, what's the self, I, I'm kind of inclined to think not much of it. Like um, most of what we'd want to say about the self, I think we could just get by with living organisms. Um, so uh, what, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm a member of the species Homo sapiens. And uh, I, I think things. I have thoughts. I have experiences. But I don't have a soul. I don't have some spiritual thing that has been the same throughout so we uh, we have a million questions for you and, and some of those are appearing from our members right now uh, i begin with uh robert who had asked about i guess uh brain states after death so how about the nature of our own consciousness and whether it extends beyond the brain physical as evidence in ndes where consciousness continues and lays down vivid memories after brain death for extended time. Yeah, so um, I, I'm inclined to not make that much out of near-death experiences. I think that um, human uh, animals were very complicated. Uh, we're made out of a whole bunch of different cells. And uh, if you wanted to kill me real dead, in the sense that making sure every one of the cells in my body was dead. Um, that won't be easy. Like you'd have to drop me into a volcano or something like that. Most of the things that kill people only kill parts of them initially, and then the other parts die later on. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising to me that, for example, uh, the heart and the lungs would stop, but the brain would keep going. Um, it wouldn't be surprising to me that parts of the brain could die before others. And it wouldn't be surprising to me that, that uh, you could revive the organism, even though certain parts were dead for a certain amount of time. Um, so when people report near-death experiences, I think they really are having experiences in the sense that there really is something going on in their brain and they are remembering it, but they're not having experiences in the sense of accurate experiences. Um, you know, so... Uh, I'm, I'm experiencing a certain number of people and I've 
uh, experiencing your hair color and, and which of you are wearing glasses and what sorts of glasses. And I presume most of that is mostly accurate. Near death experiences, I think, aren't anywhere near that accurate. Um, it, and uh, it, it, it's interesting to compare near death experience research to paranormal um, research attempts to, to verify, for example, astral projection, uh, clairvoyance. People have made claims um, about the powers in the mind exceeding what our current scientific understanding is. And um, I, I'm generally pretty skeptical about those sorts of claims. And my skepticism comes down to something like this. Um, no one has really given any evidence that there's something special going on there. By which I mean, for example, no one has ever had an out-of-body experience and then afterwards able to present the, like a number that was in a, a locked safe. No one, no one is able to extract credit card numbers after their uh, out-of-body experience. No one is a, right? No one ever comes back from the dead with like a really cool prediction about the stock market or a new scientific discovery or something like that. It's always something really kind of vague and unverifiable. Like I, I sense the presence or I think maybe I smelled Uncle Dave. Well, I don't know, maybe you, maybe you hallucinated that you smelled Uncle Dave. Uh, you sensed the presence. Well, I mean, that's so vague. It's gotta be true. Of course you sensed the presence. Maybe it was the microwave. That's what you sensed, I don't know. Um, but no one has come back and said, okay, here's how to make cold fusion. Uh, or here's, gonna, who, here's who's going to win the World Series in 2027. No one has, has done that, to my knowledge. Um, so I'm, I'm inclined to think about near-death experiences. Like, yeah, it's the, it's the brain doing stuff before it dies. We have no evidence to think that dead tissue, like dead in the sense of like all the cells are dead, nonetheless has experiences. That would be miraculous. And we have no evidence that such a miracle has occurred. And no one has come back from these near-death experiences and reported anything verifiable, anything that we should credit as anything but hallucination. Thank you. Ellen had the question, what about uh, unbidden thoughts, seemingly pop-in thoughts that don't have intentionality? Right. So, you know, the word intentionality, like a lot of philosophy, is um, a bit misleading because we have this regular English word, intentionality, and then the philosophers have their word, intentionality, and it sounds the same and spelled the same, and they even overlap a little bit um, in their meanings. When I was talking about intentionality, I just meant like about this, like the way a sentence has a grammatical subject. But in ordinary English, of course, intentionality means doing something on purpose, doing it because we intended to. Um, anyway, um, I'm inclined to think that all mental states have aboutness, but I don't think all mental states are voluntary. I, I, I think that probably most of our mental life is happening against our will or just completely orthogonal to it. Um, so I think that probably most of the mind is unconscious. If we wanted to understand how it is that I'm able to do things like hear the words that you're saying and then parse, parse them into interpretable English and come up with the appropriate response to them, that's involving all sorts of mechanisms and that are worth calling mental, at least in that aboutness sense of mental. There's all sorts of computations happening um, that are happening outside of my awareness. They're happening beneath the threshold of my consciousness. And they might even be the sorts of things about which I could never become conscious. I, I have to rely on a scientist to tell me what, what sorts of grammatical computations are happening uh, down there. Um, I think there is a distinction between what's voluntary and involuntary. Um, it's hard to know for sure what that comes down to, but I'm inclined to some kind of rough sketch like, um, what we call what we call voluntary are um, a certain sort of uh, things that happened because we wanted them to. So um, if, if I you know 
it occurs to me that um, my glasses are kind of dirty. And I might think to myself, well, would it be rude to clean my glasses in the middle of this Zoom meeting? Right? Then I might decide, yeah, well, I'm going I'm to go for it uh, and clean my glasses on my shirt. That was an intentional action. But what it meant to be intentional is that it happened because I wanted it to happen. Um, and then the things that, that are unintentional, like suddenly I find myself once again singing um, the We Built This City on Rock and Roll by Jefferson Starship. I don't really like that song very much, but every so often my wife will sing it out loud and then they get stuck. <laughs> like, you know, I'm singing it again. So that might be an unbidden, like I didn't ask for that, but now my mind is like going, you know, doing the loop um, that's happening despite my wanting it. I think it has to be the case that most of our mental states are unbidden. It, it couldn't possibly be true that all of them are voluntary. There's got to be some kind of something that you're standing on um, if you're going to lift something up, right? There's the, the, uh, the foundation upon which you stand. Um, I can't literally pick myself up by my bootstraps and hover in midair. I could pick somebody else up um, and have them off the ground, but I can't lift myself up off the ground unless there's something else that I'm suspending myself on. So if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be doing something intentionally, there has to be some unintentional basis for that, some preference that I just happen to have and not because I wanted to have it. Unfortunately, we don't have a record player that we could be playing that song. Right. <laughs> uh, that would really, really torture me. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nancy had the question, is consciousness present during hypnosis? Yes. Um, the, uh, I, I, I don't know a, a lot about hypnosis. I don't have a lot of experience with hypnosis, but my understanding of it is that it's a different um, kind of consciousness, but it, but it would not be an example of an unconscious mental state. But you know, maybe if we look at specific examples, we would have to say different things for the different examples. So one kind of hypnotic state is the sort of thing that you see demonstrated with stage, uh, stage hypnotists. Um, I've, never, I've never been hypnotized by a stage hypnotist, but I've got close friends who have, and I trust their reports. I don't think they're pulling my leg. Although maybe they were, we always have to be skeptical. But um, so I've had friends who were hypnotized by a stage hypnotist to do things like, for example, forget the number three. So the, the hypnotist says, okay, uh, when I snap my fingers, you will have completely forgotten the concept of the number three. You won't in any way remember threeness, what the word, English word three refers to. You won't remember what comes after two and before four. Everything about three will be gone. Um, okay, now go back to your tables, enjoy the rest of your evening. So then, so my friend comes back to the table, sits down with the rest of us, and now we start quizzing them, grilling them. What comes after two, but before four? And they're like, I know I should know this answer. I can't. And we're like, well, what's five minus two? Or how many stooges are there? Right? <laughs> or, or fill in the blank. Uh, right? Blank men and a baby. And they're like, I, sorry, I just, I got nothing there. And then you ask them like, well, is it like tip of the tongue? Do you feel like it's in there somewhere? And they're like, no, it's just, it's just nothing there. Um, so you might say that in that case, they like, because like afterwards, the, the, the hypnotist will say whatever the release word was, like, you know, they say chicken, and then suddenly you can remember the number three. So it's not like the information left their brain, it was still there. Um, so it's tempting to describe that case, uh, is that they, they did remember the number three, they just couldn't access it. It was locked away in there, but it was temporarily inaccessible. Uh, they couldn't access it consciously or they couldn't become conscious of it, no matter how hard they tried. But it was still in there because the hypnotist didn't have to reteach them. All they had to do was say chicken or snap their fingers again, and it all came flooding back. So that might be an example in which the, uh, there's a mental state that is 
non-conscious. But another kind of example that we might be interested in in asking this sort of question um, might be the sort of trance that someone would put you into, not as part of a stage hypnotist uh, show, but something in a more clinical or therapeutic setting um, in which you're, you're maybe invited to think about your breathing, you're trying to do some kind of like bodily scanning or monitoring, you're trying to get more relaxed. And for many people that become, they become more suggestible. Um, and so um, someone will tell you something maybe that will boost your confidence or they'll, they'll tell you something that, that will make you less anxious about certain s situations or, or certain stimuli that are, have become really problematic for you. And then after the session, you have diminished an anxiety about exactly that thing that you wanted to have diminished anxiety about. You don't know why, but somehow the suggestion worked. Um, there's some sense in which what was happening was unconscious or it's happening outside of your consciousness. There's also some sense in which it's kind of, it's a kind of influence that we're familiar with in non-hypnotic settings. So, um, you know, we, many of us have, uh, might be familiar with being convinced of certain things because certain people said or did them. Um, you know, so I often, I, my wife and I have this experience with each other. I'll be recommending some food or some music or something like that. She's like, yeah, that's, uh, it's okay if you like that, I don't. Um, but then like six months go by and one of her friends will make the exact same recommendation. And then suddenly now she's really into it, uh, right, right? So certain people have an influence on us simply because they're those, they're, they're the people that they are. It's not like they did a better sell or they, you know, gave a more convincing argument. It was just like, oh, it's not my husband <laughs> or whatever, or this is my close friend or, you know, with my own children, you know, I'll see, um, if you want to get my children to do anything, all you have to do is show someone else of the roughly the same age, do it. And then boom. So they're, they're now they're locked on. They're on mission. Um, I think hypnotic suggestion in those kinds of therapeutic clinical cases is a lot like that. So there's a so we we've each had the experience of being convinced, perhaps for reasons we're not conscious of. We're not we're not conscious of what was convincing, but nonetheless we were convinced. Hypnosis might be like that. Um, there's an you know so I think uh, one sort of case I'm tempted to draw an analogy to is um, a case that's often discussed in the literature about free will. Um, and this is a, uh, this is an experiment that is often called the pantyhose experiment by the psychologists Nisbet and Wilson, who are interested in rationality and the degree to which human, um, human action is, is rational or the result of a, a rational deliberative process. And uh, as opposed to a bunch of just irrational baloney that we are just kind of like fumbling in the dark. And then maybe after the fact, we'll lay a rational story on, but that was just a rationalization. So in the, the pantyhose experiment, you've got a bunch of shoppers that are presented with a display like you might see in an anchor store at a shopping mall. There's a table with stacks of pantyhose and they're told to choose the best pantyhose and purchase them. And then after they, the subjects make their purchase, they're um, asked some survey questions. Why did you pick these pantyhose? What was it about them that made you choose these and not the other ones that were on the table? And the people will give responses like, oh, well, I thought the fabric was obviously sturdier or it had a more inviting texture. I could tell it'd be more comfortable. Uh, I like the color. The color just seemed more vivid than the other ones. They give all sorts of answers. And the interesting thing is the answers are all bullshit. And how do we know that? How do we know these answers are not quite right? It's because all the pantyhose were physically identical. They were all exactly the same. Um, the way the situation was presented to people was kind of implicit that maybe there was supposed to be a difference and maybe people were looking for differences or something like that. But objectively, there were no differences. The only thing that predicts what pantyhose people would purchase is that there was a statistical 
uh, bias towards pantyhose presented on the right. So if they're on, on people's right, they would choose those. They, they wouldn't choose the ones on the left of the display. Maybe because most people are right-handed or something. Um, but uh, so they give all these responses that are obviously false. They have to be false. It couldn't be the case that they chose them because they were sturdier or smoother because none of them were sturdier or smoother. Um, and then there's this other interesting thing that comes out of this experiment. There's a second stage of the experiment where they present the, these facts to the experimental subjects. They're, they explain to them, they show them, you're full, of, you're full of it. These pantyhose are all the same. And they say, nah, no, that, no, no, they were different. They, they were sturdier or whatever. They stick to their stories. So um, uh, one thing to conclude from this is that um, there's all sorts of decision-making that happens unconsciously. Our behavior is driven by things that we don't have conscious access to. And further, what we do have conscious access to is a kind of baloney. And we're making up this story maybe because it's flattering to present ourselves to ourselves as rational, as you know, having reasons and having good reasons for our actions, where really we're just shooting in the dark and making it up yeah. as we go along. We, we just had a conversation with Robert Burton on being certain, which was echoing with what you're saying. Uh, there's, a, there's another question by Murray who wrote, uh, do the physical correlates of different mental stages help define them. Compare a state of consciousness with the state of sleep, for example. Yeah, so um, one, one way of stating my general view uh, about these topics is that I'm a physicalist. And what it means to be a physicalist is to say that whatever the mental is, it supervenes on the physical. And supervenience is, is, is a technical term that gets defined in the philosophy of mind as something that we might state like this. Um, if, if the physical, if the mental supervenes on the physical, that means that this class of properties, the mental properties, depend in a certain sort of way on the physical properties. And the way in which they depend is that there can't be any mental differences without there being physical differences. So um, one way there might be mental differences is if I'm different from you. Another way there might be mental differences is if I'm different from myself over time. So changing is just differences across times. So there can't be any differences between subjects with respect to their mental unless there's some kind of differences with respect to their physical, some kind of differences between their brains. And with respect to a single subject over multiple times, I can't change mentally without there being any changes physically. Um, now this supervenience relationship is a one-way relationship. So differences at the mental level require differences at the physical level, but that doesn't mean that every difference at the physical level is gonna percolate up to the mental level. There might be some physical differences that are just irrelevant. They're just too minor to make a difference. But anyway, to summarize, the idea of the of uh, physicalism is one that we can mostly put in terms of supervenience, which is a kind of dependence of uh, one kind of differences on another kind of differences. So I can only differ from you mentally or change mentally if I differ from you physically or if I myself change physically. So back to the question then, does the, the, does the physical define the mental? Um, yeah, but in this slightly complicated supervenience sort of way. So that if, um, if there is a difference between me seeing green versus seeing red, or if there's a difference between um, the way I see green today versus the way I see green when I was seven years old, there has to be some physical differences in virtue of which there are these mental differences. Maybe the physical differences are differences in my eye, maybe they're in my brain, but it's gotta be something physical somewhere. I'm inclined to think most of this stuff is in the brain. Most of the really interesting things about vision 
has very little to do with the eye and almost everything to do with the brain. And, and that's true of pain. Um, and I think that probably generalizes to most of the, our uh, conscious uh, or mental states that, that we'd be interested in. It's gonna come down to the brain. Um, so um, that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy to come up with a definition, uh, especially if you want to allow that there could be very different physical systems that are similar mentally. So perhaps there could be a system that is entirely artificial, like made out of microchips, but it has a perfect mental duplicate of my mental states. That's a possibility. So physically, we're very different because the physical basis for my mental states are a bunch of neurons. The neurons are made out of proteins and lipids. This uh, computer analog of me, uh, Robo Pete, is made out of microchips, made out of silicon and gallium arsenide. There's no protein or, or lipids in there at all. But non nonetheless, like we could both, or at least I hold, and I'm prepared to argue for the view that we could both see green. We could both see it in exactly the same way, um, even though we're physically different. So supervenience doesn't require that if we're going to be mentally the same, we have to be physically the same. It does require that if we're going to be mentally different, we have to be physically different. That's interesting. Uh, Bill has the question. Uh, say something about the psychotherapeutic attempts to change unbidden mental states for positive benefit, cognitive behavioral therapy. He continues saying, there is some belief that mental activity such as psychotherapy, traumatic experience, uh, actually change physical structures at the neural, neuronal level. So could it be a two-way mental to physical? Uh, yeah, uh, in short, I, I think, yeah. Um, so, you know, if you, you think about something like um, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, it's mostly like talk-based, um, by itself doesn't involve any drug treatments. Um, so it's tempting to describe that as being something that's mental, where drug treatment would be something physical. Um, I think it's all physical. There's some sense in which like there's nothing happening here that isn't just happening in your brain. But nonetheless, I think there's interesting distinctions we could draw, even though it's all physical, we could draw a distinction between cognitive behavioral therapy um, and a, a more drug-based uh, treatment of the, of the same. Um, in, in cognitive behavioral therapy, you're engaging someone in the process of, of speaking. Um, part of what's happening there is you're guiding someone through a, a process whereby you are um, bringing up memories, things that you might not have consciously experienced in a long time. They've just been hiding out there as these uh, not consciously access memories and then you go through the process of, of accessing them consciously and beyond just talking about them thinking about them in a strategic way thinking in an engaged way about um, different strategies for dealing with those facts or dealing with those situations or dealing with those uh, remembered feelings um, and the question of like well why would that be beneficial to you is a big giant open question but the the gist of it seems to be that uh, we have lots of different ways of storing our memories and um, and certain processes that we go through change uh, in, in some cases in a very literal way where the memories are stored and how the memories are stored um, and some of those changes can be beneficial some of those changes, can result in things that are anxiety provoking, becoming less anxiety provoking. Even though in some sense you still remember the same things, the memories no longer make you as anxious or, or what other sorts of problematic uh, or undesirable uh, states you wanna get into. And it might be possible that we have a drug that, that does the same thing. Um, there's interesting research indicating that a lot of trauma uh, 
what we think of as uh, um, post-traumatic uh, disorder. Uh, the, um, what's happening is that we're not forgetting enough, that there's something about the, the very high negative emotional uh, co-stimulus of the traumatic event that makes us unable to forget things that for other people, like you just have to sleep on it a few nights and now the, the memories have kind of faded. You're less, they become less upsetting. You're able to, to forget it. But people suffering from, from trauma, the, for everyone else who the, would be able to go through a forgetting process, they are going through this re-remembering process. They're just like, uh, like writing things down um, in, in, a, in a stronger way, which is just making it, it worse. Um, so, but to summarize, I think it's all in the brain, even though I think there's a, there's a natural way of understanding the difference between a talk-based therapy versus a drug-based theory, therapy. Ultimately, you're trying to do the same thing, which is make the brain better. Which method will make the brain better? Which, which one is, is the one that gives the patient more control? Which, which is the one that will have fewer negative side effects, we still don't know all the answers to those questions. And I don't have any reason for thinking it's gotta be talk-based versus drug-based. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, maybe it's just one of them. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's still too early uh, to tell. But really, um, there's not a real difference between the ones that are really brain-based and the ones that are not brain-based. They're all, it's all the brain. Could, could you discuss a little bit about psychedelics and why someone might think they have clarity? Yeah, so I, I think um, psychedelics are, are very, very interesting. Um, one way of thinking about psychedelics is simply that it's changing things. It, almost as if you just, you know, randomly selected a different channel to watch. Or you just randomly, you're like, I don't know what book to read. I'll just randomly pick a book off the shelf and make myself read whatever that one turned out to be. Um, sometimes simply introducing a change is significant. And it doesn't matter what the change is, just that it's a change. So um, one theory of what's happening with, with psychedelic experiences is um, in a normal or non-psychedelic um, situation, you look at, you look at a you present it with a stimulus and if you remember it if you've been taught what that thing is so like we can all recognize this is a travel mug so your concept of travel mug is automatically applied uh i show you a picture of a rhinoceros you don't even have to think about it or work at it, it just automatically boom you recognize it as a rhinoceros you are applying your concept of rhinoceros to it but in the psychedelic state there's something interrupting that. Um, so I, I, I show you this and you're just like, what is that? I've never seen it before, which is exactly the reaction you would have if like someone erased your concept of a travel mug. Like if, you, like if we could selectively surgically remove or temporarily remove your concept of a travel mug when I present you with it, it's going to seem, it's going to seem strange. It's going to seem weird. It might even seem wondrous, since you haven't decided that it's a travel mug. You you are now opening up mental space to notice things, like for example, that it's really beautiful. If you you normally don't think of travel mugs as uh, opportunities for beauty, although maybe some of you do. <laughs> I normally don't. If I'm looking for beauty, I don't turn to my travel mug for that. I look at paintings and. Um, you know, uh, fine art for that. Um, but if I, if I somehow forget that this is a travel mug, I might encounter it in this fresh way. And I might notice, um, that it resembles a person in certain ways, or I might notice that it's really astonishingly beautiful, or I might notice that there's certain things about it. that are kind of frightening. I maybe never noticed before that a certain part of it looks like a skull. And then, and then that starts making me think about death and, um, and if I've also forgotten, you know, other concepts, this might, a mirror travel mug, send me into this uh, very chaotic and, and maybe even disturbing uh, mental state. Um, 
So there's one way of thinking about psychedelics whereby um, you're just introducing a change to the system. Some of what's happening to the change in the system is that it's interrupting the normal kinds of um, memories that you, or, uh, or conceptual recognitions uh, that you normally would bring to bear. Um, so things that usually would just be really boring are, are suddenly presented to you as, as if an alien stepped off of the spaceship. Um, it just becomes uh, strange and wondrous. Uh, combine that with a, a lot of um, psychedelics uh, have this other aspect to them, which is changing um, changing the setting on a filter in your perceptual systems that in normal waking consciousness um, is very data driven and uh, and not very expectation driven. Uh, let me unpack that a little bit. So one way of thinking about a, a typical perceptual state, is you've got a bunch of new information coming in and then you've got a bunch of like old information. Um, these are the memories that make up our concepts that we use when we recognize things. You've got a lot of old information that constitutes your expectations. Um, and in a perceptual state, there needs to be a balance between those two factors. If, if, you, um, if you had it be entirely data-driven, you would be thrown off by all sorts of errors or noise. Uh, so for example, if you're looking at a cat and the cat um, is partially occluded by uh, a stop sign pole, if you were operating in a fully data-driven way, you'd be really thrown off by that pole. You wouldn't be able to recognize it as a cat. But if you had a, a, a certain amount of top-down expectation-driven, um, processing going on, then you're able to work off the fact that most of that thing I'm looking at looks like a cat. And so I suppose there's some more cat behind the pole. Uh, so we need, a, we need in an ordinary case, a balance between what's the expectations and uh, uh, data. In, uh, in many psychedelic states, uh, what is happening is that you're turning the dial or the drug is turning the dial. So things become almost not at all uh, 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 data-driven. Um, I'm sorry, I got that backwards, not expectation-driven. So all this, it's just data um, and, and you're lacking the, the stability that you have in, in uh, normal, the normal uh, perceptual case. So um, in a normal perceptual case, you could look at some muddy footprints on the bathroom floor and just see it as muddy footprints on the bathroom floor. But if you're if you're tripping on LSD or mescaline or something like that, you see a bunch of muddy footprints on the floor. Now it looks like the devil, and now it looks like my wife, and now it looks like a, a VW uh, bug driving off of a cliff, and now it looks like a travel mug, and now it looks like a rhinoceros, and now it's the devil again. What's with that? Um, now it's Jefferson Starship, and they're all singing, "We built yeah. the city on rock and roll." Um, right. So. Now that kind of, those states can be really useful for different purposes. So like people that are um, seeking creative inspiration or they're seeking uh, to have a spiritual experience um, or they're just seeking a healing experience or they just need some kind of um, monkey wrench thrown into their routine. It could be really useful to have that kind of jolt to the system, to mix everything up and have it settle in, in new ways. Um, I, so that's the way I think of, of psychedelics. I often encounter uh, in my students some kind of belief that psychedelics are magic. So they, when we, when we, for example, talk about computers and robots and whether they could be conscious, I'll always, every semester, I'll have a student who says, why don't we just give it LSD? And they're serious. Like they think if we just, we, we pour this magical chemical into the computer, the computer is going to become alive. Um, I don't think psychedelics are magical at all. I, you know, I think they're just, uh, they're shaking up the system in ways that are, are can be useful, can be beautiful, uh, can be fun. Um, one interesting question is why they exist. Like, why are there these plants out there in, uh, in nature that are able to engage with our nervous systems in 
in such profound ways. Some people are tempted to say that they must have been put there by the gods uh, or the aliens who put life on, on the planet Earth. And, but probably, uh, um, probably the reason that these plants have chemicals in them that interface with our nervous systems in really interesting ways is because of insects. Most plants have the various chemicals that they do in order to attract certain in insects and repel certain others. In order for them to do that, the chemicals have to interface with the insects' nervous systems in certain ways. And we're not that different from insects. All life on earth comes from a, a common ancestor. And so what, you know, what works for one nervous system is gonna work somewhat on another nervous system. And I think that's, that's what the answer to that question is, is why, why do these chemicals exist in the first place? And it's because of bugs and we're similar enough to bugs that they affect us too. That's really interesting. I've not heard that uh, relationship. Uh, David has a question for you in voice. Hi, uh, it's a fascinating presentation. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, uh, Thomas mentioned a salon we had just recently with Robert Burton, who was talking about his book on being certain, but he mentioned something that I've heard echoed by other, both neuroscientists and, neuro uh, well, he's a neurologist, but, uh, and also philosophers, and that is that uh, consciousness is in fact an epiphenomenon, that we, uh, along the evolutionary pathway as the brain evolved, we became uh, capable of increasing complex thought, increase, incre uh, more complex neural pathways, uh, interneuronal connections, and so forth. And, um, and at some point, we kind of reached a critical mass, and consciousness then kind of evolved. Uh, I think of it almost like a big bang. All of a sudden, uh, there was consciousness. And qualia, which the ability to, to feel and you know, have basically have an emotional sensory experience evolved. But, um, you know, I, I wonder, you know, if you accept that, if that's something that, that uh, resonates with you. And also um, the notion that uh, we as humans could probably get along without consciousness, we could function do it, you know, uh, we wouldn't necessarily need, need consciousness to, to, to function in this physical world. And if, if you agree with that, and if that's the case, then why did consciousness evolve? Um, that's the evolutionary basis for it. So if you comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I think those are really, really cool questions. And I, I think a lot about them. Um, so there's one, one thing I wanna say just as kind of a throat clearing exercise is that in these discussions, there's two definitions of epiphenomenalism that get get brought up there's one which is the very very much the philosopher's sense of epiphenomenalism whereby something is epiphenomenal if it has no causal effects whatsoever um this would be a very mysterious sort of case where like so on certain versions of dualism um the 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 mind is a thing separate from the brain it arises from the brain. Um, the brain has effects on it, but it has effects on nothing. That's one version of epiphenomenalism that philosophers discuss and, and worry about. They worry that, usually they're worried that they have a view that accidentally entails epiphenomenalism. They're trying to avoid that. Another use of the word epiphenomenalism, and this seems to be the one you're more interested in. This is the one that when scientists say epiphenomenal, they have in mind. Um, whereby something is epiphenomenal, it doesn't mean it has no causal effects. It might have causal effects, but it itself is kind of more of a side effect. Um, so to illustrate this latter sense of epiphenomenal, um, think of uh, the, the smoke that comes out of a, a train whistle. Um, the, the train whistle was designed in such a way that you could release steam and, you know, the, and the release of the steam will generate a sound. The fact that the steam is visible is irrelevant for the functioning of this system. One might say it's just a side effect. The visibility of the smoke isn't doing anything for the whole whistling 
system to work. Another example might be foam on the on a ocean wave. The foam is going up and down, and the, and the 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 foam's going up and down is correlated with the wave going up and down. But the foam is literally just along for the ride. The foam isn't making the wave do anything. The wave is doing all the work. But the foam is not totally causally isolated. We could see the foam, so therefore light is bouncing off the foam and going in our eyes. So anyway. I'm going to focus on the second sense of epiphenomenal, but we can come back to the first sense if people are interested in it. The question of whether consciousness is epiphenomenal in that second sense is, is pretty interesting. Um, and I don't have a very, uh, I don't have a high degree of confidence that I know what's going on here, but I'm still prepared to make a bet. Um, and my bet would go something like that uh, consciousness is kind of a side effect not totally a side effect but it's kind of a side effect and um what it most immediately arises out of in our evolution as as human beings is the cognitions that we had to go through in order to be language using social hunters so um and if you you know if you've raised children and if you've seen the way they acquire language you realize there's an enormous amount of intelligence that goes into it it might not be conscious intelligence. It's all like my kids aren't sitting down and thinking about how to assimilate these grammatical categories. They just do. And, and you know, by the time they're seven or eight, it's amazing how much language that they've, that they've picked up. So there's an enormous amount of really complicated machinery that distinguishes me from my dog, even though the dog is also a social hunter. But I'm a social hunter that is able to cooperate with my conspecifics in virtue of using language and part of the language allows us to talk about each other so i you know i'm not just talking about the mammoth if you know throw the spear at the saber tooth tiger i'm talking about like you know uh hey david why don't you go back to the hut and get some more spears right so i need to i need to be thinking about david as someone who himself is thinking i need to i need to have some kind of way of tracking what David's able to track and David's able to do that to me. And then once you have that kind of capacity to be able to think of other thinkers as thinkers, well, it, it's just a, a quick step and a jump to being able to apply that to yourself. Um, and like to, to be able to think to yourself, oh, I'm thinking, <laughs> I have thoughts. I wonder what I'm gonna be thinking about next. I hope it's something good. We need to figure out how to take down that mammoth. Um, and that's what consciousness is. And this really connects with that definition of consciousness that we discussed at the beginning of the session, whereby a conscious state is one that you're conscious of. That capacity of self-reflective or self-aware uh, consciousness, I think comes along with this uh, big, this general package that you get as being a socialized language using creature. Now that, um, that language use didn't come from nowhere. It's not, it's not like we had no consciousness in any sense, but somehow we had language. And then once we have language, the lights come on. I think the way to, to think about the story is that there's these other kinds of consciousness first. Um, but the big one, the one that we're really interested in, the one that distinguishes us from cats and dogs, that's the one that comes along with this language package. Uh, uh, another thing I want to say in connection with this issue, and I'm not sure how to connect it with language, but there is an interesting kind of experimental paradigm um, that can be applied to non-human animals that distinguishes types of learning that seem to depend on consciousness from types of learning that seem to not depend on consciousness. In these experiments, you are um, modulating consciousness um, by modulating attention. Um, so one version of this experiment is something you could do at rabbits and you can condition, uh, an eye blink, uh, response. Um, so you, you know, if you blow a little bit of air into the eye of a rabbit, it'll blink. Um, and you can condition them to blink in response to a, a bell ringing, right? So normally a bell ringing wouldn't make them blink, but you some Pavlov sort of thing. You ring the bell while you blast them in the face with the hairdryer or whatever, and uh, and soon they'll learn to blink 
in response to that bell. Now, one kind of um, condition you can um, introduce is to introduce a delay between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus. So um, one kind of learning is learning where the two stimuli are presented simultaneously. And another kind of learning is learning where one of the stimuli only is presented later. So in order for there to be some kind of association between the, the, the two stimuli, there has to be some kind of memory of the, of the earlier stimulus. That's the only way it's gonna have any kind of effect later on in the creature. And then the, the way you modulate consciousness is you by modulating attention with a distractor. So if you, if you do something to distract the rabbit, and I think they do something like, like play a loud noise, like a recording of thunder or, or a flashing light or both. Um, if, you, if you introduce these distracting stimuli, presumably that interrupts attention in the same way it might interrupt our attention. Um, and that messes with their ability to learn the association across a memory delay. It doesn't mess with their ability to learn the association when the two stimuli are presented simultaneously. So some researchers interpret that as uh, evidence of non-epiphenomenality of consciousness. But there, they're, what they mean by consciousness is something that they're closely defining in terms of attention, what you're attending to versus not attending to. Um, what that has to do with language, I have no idea. I mean, rabbits obviously don't talk much. So um, that seems to be a very different sort of thing than what I was saying about us being language using social hunters. But nonetheless, that is an interesting um, piece of data that seems to indicate that perhaps there's certain kinds of learning that consciousness is enabling in us. Um, and, you know, maybe that learning is why we evolved consciousness in the first place. Maybe it's, it's a, a beneficial side effect of this larger package. I have nothing really to, to help decide, you know, between those choices. Um, we have, do you wanna have a question here? Yeah, um, sort of related to this. We met uh, with a neuroscientist years ago who's associated with Barrow Neurological here in Phoenix. And he was working on theories of consciousness and uh, kind of breakdowns in uh, mental, uh, I guess, diseases like schizophrenia and things like that. And he was relating it to timing. And he made a suggestion that's kind of stuck with me all these years that we experience the world in very small slices that are not actually continuous and that consciousness pulls it all together. Kind of like the, uh, the cells of a movie uh, that are all just discrete little chunks and then you run it fast enough and it becomes the movie. Have you heard anybody talk about that or consider that type of thing? Because timing is an issue in brains for certain things. And he was convinced that it, it had a lot to do with a lot of things. In the brain. Yeah, so there's a lot of, uh... Like the, the topics of time and consciousness intersect in, in lots of really uh, interesting ways. Um, you know, one of them um, has to do with the fact that we, we often perceive things as happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So for example, I can, I can perceive that uh, at, the, at the exact moment that someone snapped their fingers, someone else touched my shoulder or I can perceive that at the exact moment that I stomp my foot, I clap my hands. But if you really think about all the machinery that has to be working uh, together to make that all happen, you appreciate that, um, well, that's really, that's a really hard problem. Like how, how would you build a brain to be able to perceive that something happened at the sole of your foot and at your shoulder happened at the same time. And part of what makes that so hard is that um, 
the speed of a nerve signal is actually really slow. Uh, I once heard it um, compared to the speed of a donkey drawn cart. Now, uh, that's, a, that's a really lousy speed, especially if you're trying to get to Indianapolis uh, from, from Newark. But even with respect to the size of the human body, uh, even the, those, those distances, uh, that's still a, a fairly slow speed. And there's a pretty significant difference in the amount of time it would take for a stimulus to travel from your shoulder to your brain versus from your foot to your brain. So you've got all these different stimuli hitting the brain at all these different times. How is the brain able to make a decision about whether these two things happen at the same time versus whether they they happened uh, at different times. Part of the story is that the brain just doesn't care. And I think um, as a general point, when we examine these sorts of issues, it's really important to appreciate the difference between the brain representing something as being there. So in, in the sort of example you're asking about, representing continuity, and just not representing discontinuity. So, so it's one thing to represent something, it's another thing to just ignore it or be silent on it. Uh, so um, most of the times we don't experience our mental lives as being filled with discontinuities. I think that's safe to say. I don't think it's safe to say that we experience our mental lives as having continuity. I think probably that most of the time we just fail to notice all the discontinuities. But that's different from creating a hallucination of, of continuity. Um, one illustration of this sort of thing that I'm talking about is an example that comes from the philosopher and cognitive scientist, Daniel Dennett. Um, his example might not be immediately apparent, but it kind of illustrates this difference between um, representing the presence of something and just failing to, to represent its absence. Um, so he says, imagine you walk into a room and the wallpaper of the room is a, a print of uh, Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe's. And there's probably hundreds of them on this one wall. So, so when you have a visual experience of a wall as being covered with a hundred Marilyn Monroe's, what is the nature of the representation of the brain? Now, one way to represent that would be something analogous to a photograph or a drawing, whereby corresponding to each of the Marilyn Monroe's in the real world, there is a portion of the drawing. So for every Marilyn Monroe out there, you need a little Marilyn Monroe drawing. That would be um, what we might call a pictorial or picture-like representation scheme. But a different way of representing that is the sort of thing that we see exemplified in language. I could, in English, just say something like a bunch of Marilyns uh, or a whole lot of Marilyns uh, or um, more than 200 Marylands. Each of those linguistic descriptions are completely silent on the precise number of Marylands. Right. If there's 300 Marylands, you don't need the representation to have 300 parts. Like I don't need 300 words in the, rep in the sentence that says there's 300 Marylands. Um, how, how literally is the brain representing in a ling linguistic way or a language-like format is unclear. Uh, but nonetheless, like this is a this is a general possibility that we have to take seriously, that the way we represent what's out there is in this very kind of schematic way. Like we just represent it's that oh, there's more Maryland's there, um, or another sort of example is um, again a visual example. We have these blind spots in our uh, retina. Uh, each each of our eyes has a region in the retina where all of the sensory uh, transducer cells are feeding into the optic nerve. 
And that there's this region in visual space that corresponds to that blind spot where the, where the optic nerve is. And most of the time we don't notice that it's there. In order to become aware that it's there, you have to do something like, um, you know, one version of this, you like move your finger in your visual field until you see like a re portion of your finger disappear. Another version of this, there's like two black spots on a white piece of paper and you kind of move the paper forward and back until the spots disappear. When they disappear, the spots are perfectly aligned with your optic, that optic nerve region in the retina, the blind spot of, of the retina. And that raises a question that's analogous to the one you're trying to ask about time. Um, and we might put the question like this, does the brain fill in? Does the brain generate a hallucination corresponding to that uh, blind spot, right? That would be one way we would fail to notice the blind spot is if we hallucinated there, that there was no blind spot. But another way um, for things to work is that we just never, except in a few rare cases, we just never think about that region of our visual field. So we don't have a positive representation of there being something in the blind spot. We just don't have a representation of what's going on in the blind spot. And that's good enough. Does that, now if it worked in that latter case where we, our brains are just silent about what's going on in the brain spot, would that mean that the brain is providing a continuity that isn't really there? And I think that there's a very clear way in which, no, that's not what it's doing. It's not providing a continuity. It's just silent on the, the fact that there's a discontinuity. It doesn't represent the discontinuity. And by failing to represent the discontinuity, that's really good enough. You don't need to have a representation of a continuity. So to bring it back to time, in many cases, um, we get by with something like, um, yeah, they happen at the same time. The, uh, yeah, I felt it. I felt the the shoulder and the and the foot at the same time. But in reality, the information got to the brain at two different at two different times. Um, and maybe most of the time, you don't even have an opinion about it at all when they when they both happen. Um, so I'm I'm inclined to think that for for most of these sorts of situations, the the best explanation is the is the one that's analogous to the more Maryland's. You just have kind of a sketchy representation in the brain that says like, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff going on out there. And it's, it's silent about what it is. Yeah. Another kind of example, uh, just real quick, because it's so fun. Um, the, uh, and it's, again, it's visual. Many people are unaware of the fact that in their visual periphery, they aren't able to see hue. So, um, and I test this with my students. I'll, I'll have like uh, these fluorescent post-it notes, you know, fluorescent magenta, bright green, bright yellow. And I, and I ask them, do you think, even though this is just in the periphery, just in the region where you could just start to see it, do you think you tell what color it is? And they all say, yes, definitely. And then we do a little demonstration and it turns out that they're garbage. Like they can't, they can't tell the difference between magenta and, and green. Now, does that mean that the way we consciously perceive our visual periphery is as black and white or shades of gray? No, I mean, I, but does that mean that the brain is coloring it in? Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case because in, in the example with my students, I, you know, I'll ask them, does it seem colored? They'll say, yeah, it seems colored. But then I ask them, well, what color is it? And they're like, oh, <laughs> it's just now dawning on me. I have no idea what color it is. And then you ask them again, so is it colored? And they're like, well, we don't know what to say. But I think that the thing to say there is that the brain just doesn't care. Like we, we can see, we can see that there's stuff out here. As a matter of fact, there's no information here about color, but we just, our brain doesn't care. And so it's just silent about what's happening in the visual periphery, even though in some sense, whatever is in the visual periphery isn't presented as colored. But yeah. that doesn't mean it's presented as being black and white. Yeah. It's uh, just simply, you know, there's some stuff there. 
Yeah, a fascinating book that made me think more about what you're talking about now is called What We See When We Read by Peter Mendelssohn. He's in New York and he asks you to kind of contemplate what you see when you read Anna Karenina, what does she look like? And people finish the book and they don't, they can't articulate what she looks like, even though they think they know her really well after reading the whole book. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's a great book. But it's Absolutely all- fascinating. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, um, you know, many of us have the experience of like, we'll get a new haircut or, or something like that. And, uh, or for me, I'll like shave some part of my beard or something like that. And then I'll, you know, I'll show up among my coworkers or my students. And I figure like, you know, they've been staring at my face all semester. Surely they'll notice that I used to have long hair and a beard. And now I have short hair and, and no beard. Surely they'll notice. Nah, I might get something like, is there something different about you? And they're just like, <laughs> they can't, they can't put their finger on it. Um, you know, so it's amazing how um, how little, it, how much we get by on on actually very little. And then back to back to our discussion about psychedelics. One one thing that happens, at least sometimes, with psychedelics, is you start to notice this mm-hmm. that that resetting or cleansing uh, puts you in a state where you notice all these con- continuity, uh, these sorry, all these discontinuities. Uh, you become aware of, for example, um, how when you when you look at something, you can only ever focus on one part of it, or that when you move your, uh, you know, so there's all these different portions of the visual scene that are blurry at any given moment. Um, when you really become interested in getting things in clear focus, you realize it's impossible to get it all in clear focus, or you you notice things like um, that the the colors of objects rarely are what you what you think they are. Um, so, you, you know, there might be a white piece of paper or you looking at your house and you think of your house as like off white, but in different parts of the day, the actual color light is, is very different. Sometimes it's purple light coming off the house. Sometimes at night, the sky literally is orange, but most people, they just think of the sky as dark. It's dark, <laughs> right? Uh, they don't think of orange as a dark color, but when you're, you take these psychedelics, you start noticing things like, yeah, every, like there's always photophosphines in my visual field. There's always visual noise. There's always sparkles. Uh, floaters in my eyes are always there uh, waiting for me to notice and get freaked out about. There's always these big gaps, these discontinuities. Things are blurry um, or there's, there's things I can't even like Anna Karenna, like I can't even bring her face to mind or, you know, uh, there's all sorts of people that we, we see on a daily basis uh, and we've never noticed the color of their hair. You ask like, you know, Joe, the coworker, is he brunette or blonde? You're like, I see him every day. We were working together for 20 years. I actually don't know if he's blonde or brunette. <laughs> like, how can that be? And, you know, the best explanation is that on some level, the brain just is representing in this very sparse linguistic sort of way it's not drawing pictures of 100 Maryland's. It's just saying to itself, ah, there's more than 100 Maryland's over there. This is a really great. Before we go, I'd like to ask you when your new book is coming out. Um, <laughs> this has been a very rough couple of years, um, not just because of COVID, but also I have a bunch of really uh, small children. Um, so, uh, so one of my books should be out this year. The second edition of this is Philosophy of Mind. He is supposed to be out this year. I think it'll probably be out in the fall. Uh, so it could be, you know, because because the publishers, they want to synchronize this with college courses and, and book purchasing. So I think they're aiming for this to be out in like August uh, so people can can buy it for the fall semester. And then the book that, uh, uh, and so that's in press right now. That's, you know, with the, with the uh, typesetter. Uh, it's already been through copy editing. Then the other book, the one I'm still writing, this is the one about physicalistic theories of consciousness. Um, I'm burning up my uh, a, a six-month extension, and I'm going to get ready to ask for another one. Uh, 
So it's a little up in the air what when that's going to be done. It should have been done by now. It should be impressed, but uh, I'm still writing it. So maybe not until next year for that one. But a treat. Well, uh, it'd be our pleasure if we could have you back sometime. Well, I'd be delighted to come back. I, I really enjoyed this. It, it's a treat because we we've only scratched the surface of all our million questions. So it's, yeah, it's, so definitely don't don't lose my number. I'd be delighted to come back and talk more. I'm uh, I'm always always willing to talk about this stuff. That's great. that's great. Well, you might uh, enjoy uh, knowing about Ogi Ogus, who's going to be with us next Sunday. He's at Harvard. On he wrote a book on the evolution it's of called the journey of the mind. Uh, he takes uh, the concept of mind all the way back to an archaean single celled organism. That sounds very cool. Oh, it's a yeah. Very, I'm sorry. A great book. Anyway, he's with us next next Sunday. Sunday. He's at Harvard. I will I will check that out because you know uh, I had mentioned E. coli bacteria. We didn't really get to talk about that, but oh yeah, a no, lot of my work. I um, found this, his book to be one of the most fascinating ever. Yeah, I'm very interested in the in the history of the mind, um, but also I've got a project um, on the future of the mind, uh, and that's another thing we didn't get to talk about much today. Yes. But I've got a book, uh, the working title of which is Alternate Minds, and it's about science fictional and speculative treatments of, of the mind with oh, the with the aim of trying to see just how how flexible is the concept of mind how, how far can we stretch it and so some of this has to do with um, thinking about enhancements you know near future technological enhancements of brains and what it, what it might mean to give yourself more willpower or more intelligence um, you know, some of this stuff, it seems like a blessing, but rapidly becomes a curse. Like if you were able to just turn a knob and crank up your willpower, that might be a bad thing. You might, you know, sometimes you need to quit bad projects. You know, if you, if you set out to walk across the United States and you sprain your ankle, uh, uh, you know, on the first leg of the trip, you really should stop. But if you had infinite willpower, you would just keep on walking until you were down to bloody stumps. Um, so a lot of these limitations that we wish we could exceed, it, it turns out when you imagine exceeding them, it turns out to be counterproductive and really uh, interestingly illuminating about what those concepts were in the first place. So some of it has to do with thinking about things like enhancements that we might encounter in the next couple of decades. Some of it deals with really far out stuff, like what if you had um, what if you had a, an intelligent being that was literally the whole um, biosphere of a planet or was it was a massive group entity? What would it what would it mean to to have a group consciousness maybe instantiated in, in just like five or six uh, creatures or maybe a whole planet of billions of creatures? Um, what uh, what might cognition be if time travel was real? What if you had a, a computer that can go back in time or go forward in time? And what would that mean for intelligence if you were able to introduce uh, time travel into it? And then the final chapter of the project is is about anti minds and um, the question of the, that gets dealt with when we wrestle with Fermi paradox and the yeah. distribution of intelligence throughout the universe um, and hypothetical scenarios whereby it might turn out that intelligence is one of the worst things that evolution has ever come up with and really successful organisms in the galaxy have figured out ways of detecting and eliminating intelligence they've figured out how to evolve beyond intelligence and those are anti-minds so these are systems that don't have minds um, just like you have antibodies in your immune system these biological uh, entities have anti-minds that are able to detect and eliminate instances of intelligence um our, our, so that that that's another uh direction to go in with this stuff is uh, towards the future so fascinating. our friend uh, physicist frank wilczek said that advanced minds uh would figure out how to go inward not outward uh, how right so that's another go? solution to the fermi paradox like one yeah uh, once you're smart enough you could build a, a really great virtual world to explore uh and so you could just imagine all the aliens that you'd want to. You wouldn't have to fly across the galaxy to meet 
I, I want to give you some compliments here written by our members uh, as we conclude. Colleen wrote, uh, she thought it was outstanding and uh, she's gonna purchase her books. And then Steve wrote, uh, great salon, Pete, you were remarkably clear about a, a lot of rather confusing concepts and arguments in the field. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody.